All right, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, this is the third and final critic to critic conversation that we're hosting in this strand of events as part of the Weight of Words exhibition project. I wanna say a big and very sincere thank you to Claire O'Dowd, the Institute's research curator, and to all of her colleagues at the Henry Moore Institute for collaborating with me on these talks and on the other strands of poetry readings, opening events, and of course the exhibition itself. Now the exhibition's title will be very familiar. The phrase, the weight of words is pretty much a cliche. It's a commonplace way of metaphorizing the idea that words have an impact which is disproportionate to their simple presence. And when we borrowed this cliche as the title for the exhibition, we were very intentionally invoking that familiar sentiment, the idea that words mean more than they are. But we also wanted to play on a literalization of that metaphor because the exhibition also explores the actual physical weight of inscription, of speech as sound waves, of things we use to convey expressions of language in general when it's treated sculpturally. So in this series of discussion events, we wanted to invite people who have thought profoundly about how we pay attention to one or the other of sculpture and poetry or even better, people who care about how we pay attention to both of these art forms. So when we were first planning this whole project, we found ourselves attracted time and again to the work of practitioners and critics who seem to be asking, what kinds of new attention do we need to invent to engage with the work of the sort in this exhibition? And which traditions of inventive attention should we return to and learn from? So these discussions, like tonight, each bring together a pair of people on a kind of intellectual blind date. One has an expert perspective on literary history, the other on art history, but both of them know a lot about the bit in between. So our hope is really simple, but pretty ambitious. We want to think with each of our pair of guests in informed ways about different practice and histories of making and receiving work that's done in the space between poetry and sculpture, or more broadly, literature and the visual or plastic arts. Now, tonight's conversation is pre-recorded because of the curse of transatlantic time zone differences. Um, I'm sorry that that means we can't take audience questions live. My apologies for that, but I'm going to do my best on everyone's behalf to... Uh, prompt these two and steer the conversation. So we're, we're joined by the power of Zoom from uh, Winston-Salem in North Carolina by Lucy Olford and from London by John Douglas Miller. Now biographies for both of our guests are being shared along with this video and I won't repeat any of that. I just wanna thank them both for joining us. It's not been easy to make it work. <laughs> Um, like ever in this little strand of conversations, um, I've suggested that both of our guests open with a little bit of autobiographic introduction to tell us a little bit about their own interests and, and experiences in working at this intersection between literature and art. Um, so, John, would you like to start for us? Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, that question of uh, the the intersection or the meeting of uh, what we're calling literature on the one hand and visual art on the other was something that that became particularly interesting to me around i don't know maybe 20 the late 2010 20 the 2090s um when there seemed to be this kind of emergence of text based work that wasn't um straightforward conceptualism but was something more like a kind of um well the name that it came under was something like art writing which became a, a kind of institutionalized form it didn't mean art uh, uh, writing about art it was more um this this posited as a kind of new form of writing across art um and essentially i became interested in it because i was bothered by the question of whether this was simply a kind of institutionalization of something that already existed. So at that time, there were courses emerging in art writing um, and galleries started showing work that was sort of coming out of this term. 
and it was something that I started to question. And so this intersection of <clears throat> the literary and the artistic or the literary and the plastic arts was, was sort of something that came into question at that point for me. Um, and later I went on and I started studying, I did a PhD um, where I was working on the American language poets um, who, you know, at their most sort of naive form posit a sort of a materiality of language whereby taking from, say, Russian formalism and the idea of uh, roughing up language, you could actually directly kind of um, make an intervention into the space, uh, into social space via language. Um, and that started, again, it became sort of problematic for me and I started to become more interested in um, something beyond language as a kind of conceptual articulator and towards a kind of uh, questions around emotion and affect and the body and embodiment. Um, and that's kind of where my interests lie now. Uh, I started working on a biography of the photographer Peter Hujar. Um, I'm just going to try and share screen here. Um, and this, in, in a way, is as far away from what I've been working on in the last 10 years around uh, language poetry and what was known for a while and possibly still is as conceptual poetry. Um, and I moved into the territory very much of questions around affect and the body. Um, and so for me, the question of, of where language comes into this is sort of, it's become far more of a question around what provokes poesis in the first instance, rather than um, its manifestation as a, as a, as a, a conceptual artifact or, or whatever. Um, so, so for me, I suppose this, this conversation tonight is, is interesting because it marks a space of how far I've moved from maybe some of the concerns that we, that, you know, around conceptualism, around, um, uh, language as material artifact towards something around embodiment, which I think, you know, there are works in the exhibition that certainly speak to this, and maybe we'll come back to that later, but for now. Thanks, John, that's amazing. What, what, I, I think I know this photo on the front, but... Oh. So that, that is Peter. Hujar. That is Peter Hujar himself, yeah. I mean, uh, just to speak to that as well, I mean, part of what interests me, say, in, in Hujar's work is very much to do with modes of attention and the staging of an encounter um, so there is definitely something there that we could maybe come back to but the, the, what interests me about the staging of these encounters i'll just show another couple of portraits um is that there's a kind of staging of um consent um and that's something that interests me with regards to artworks in general but there's a staging of consent there's a staging of a power relation um, I always feel that with these works, there's a, a sense in what in which what's being asked, the subject of the work is asking, you know, am I doing this right? And the kind of interest of the moral gesture of the work is that 99% of the time the answer is yes. So there's a kind of anxiety in the work, but there's also this, um, as I say, kind of staging of consent within the work. It's a kind of unique mode of attention i think that's being manifested there and maybe that's something as well that we might talk about and and just to just for contextual reference huge's period and he's shooting analog large format photos is that right and... yes yeah so uh, period is from uh, the late 1950s up till 1987 when he died of aids in new york he spent all his life pretty much in manhattan with a couple of trips to italy wow Thanks, John. That's a lovely way. Um, Lucy, would you mind doing the same and giving us a little bit of a, a sense of where you're coming from here? Sure, of course. And also just um, 
thank you both. And especially thank you, Nick, for um, for inviting us to do this and for um, doing all of the work of organizing across um, time zones and technologies. Um, so I was really pleased um, to hear the way that you were talking about the weight of words just now, um, because that in some ways, you know, in, encapsulates on the one hand, um, we have that sort of original meaning of the weight of words, um, you know, in a sort of metaphorical sense that wants to lift off and think about meaning. And then on the other hand, there's this counter pull um, into the material. And I think that's really where, um, where my thinking has also been dwelling a lot recently in terms of thinking about more poetic language as um as as medium and as as material um and also as um nested in and emerging from material conditions um i can say that you know when i um actually started being my i guess my interest in the relationship between poetry and the visual arts started when i was quite young because i really um was in some ways torn between like working on like loving making artworks and loving making poems um and seeing them as somehow kind of um connected in some way that I didn't understand at the time um my first that came out um, like a confession there Lucy <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah right <laughs> um I mean I think you know I think also um so I can say you know my 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 interest in attention um, started when I was a graduate student at Aberdeen. Um, and I wrote a dissertation there um, on, on an ethics of attention, thinking through the kind of increasing porosity and, and entanglements of um, ethical thought um, into the 21st century, particularly with economic and environmental sort of um, porosities and modes of of codependence, you know, at the species and cellular levels, um, and started thinking about, you know, what would what would it mean to think about uh, attention as, in some ways, you know, an insufficient but necessary precondition for um, for any kind of ethical relation, you know, before we think about moral response, um, before we think about a kind of um, positive content of of an ethics. Um, what would it mean to think first about attention? You know, in order to respond, we must first attend. In order to respond to anything or anyone, um, to a you or a thou or this giant crisis, um, there has to be a, an attendant, an, an attending to the complexity um, and to um, to the object or situation or other from from as many sides and and in as many dimensions as as we're capable, right? Um, and I and I started from there thinking about about poetry and poetic language as a particularly dense and complex site of attention, right? So if if in some ways there there might be some good, right, in honing a, our tools for for subtle and sustained attention in the world, uh, where might we where might we practice that? <laughs> Right, right. Um, safely, <laughs> right, um, and continuously, and it struck me that in some ways poems, for the way that with they seem to require um, a certain intensity of attention of us um, in their refusal, ideally, to um, of paraphrase of certain kinds or of of simplifications of oversimplifications of world or object or perception. Um, you know, that the way in which language both asks us to um, work in the mind, right, work with mental representations, um, and also work with material, work with sound and space on the page, um, the visual and the tactile, um, struck me as a really sort of dense and, and um, rich site for thinking about attention. Um, so my first book sort of emerged out of that as a separate project, really thinking, you know, I've how does attention work in poetry? Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, you know, attention has been a part of the conversation about poetic language um, for many centuries, you know, going back to Aristotle. Um, but there isn't, there hasn't been really a, a, an articulation or a, or a lexicon or a way of talking about the forms attention takes in poetic language. And so in, in my first book, Forms of Poetic Attention, 
um, I really look at, I tried to, you know, sort of like create a, a way of talking about the diversity of forms of attention that poetic language both produces and requires of us um, at both the readerly and the writerly levels. Um, and what I found in working on that book is that, you know, I think there, there's, there was a desire for, for, um, for, you know, poems to all do a certain thing with attention. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I think what I found is that poems do a great deal, many things with our attention, right? And so it required thinking about, well, what does it mean to be asked by a poem to move, to attend both to presence and absence at once, or to attend both to a, a, an immediate physical presence and also a movement of the imagination into metaphor, for example, mm -hmm. um, or to att attend to an open space of potential, right? In a kind of mode of vigilance, thinking about Simone Weil in that um, state of being openly receptive but without an object to really hold on to in the way that the poems of Malamé for example ask us to to hold open our attention or even the poems of Hölderlin ask us to hold open our attention um, in certain states of of vigilance and expectancy. Um, since that project I became really interested in in thinking um, and this is I think resonant with what John was saying, thinking about the more embodied and material dimensions of both language and attention. So I think there's often an impulse to think of attention as in the sort of at the at an almost abstracted, purely cognitive level, mm -hmm. um, as though it were sort of outside of the body, <laughs> right? When in fact every every our 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 capacity to attend, the nature of our our of our perceptions is so dependent upon you know um our our physiological state right our physical environments um our material conditions of life and work right um that all our very capacity to attend um to anything or anyone is so de is so deeply rooted in in our mortal forms in our precarious environments right which may be more or less precarious, dependent on our degree of privilege, our degree of life comfort. Um, and so really thinking about attention, particularly poetic attention, um, as rooted in a, in a mortal body, right, as deeply connected to the vital signs of that mortal body. Um, and then also as embedded in physical environments um, and economies of dependence, right, De economies of lack and abundance and um, inequitable distribution. Um, and so in this next project, vital, which is called Vital Signs, um, I'm thinking about the relationship between poetic language and in some ways more, you know, um, more broadly, poesis more broadly as it moves beyond what is called a poem, um, you know, but the act of making um, and the ways that that both reflects and emerges from, um, the vital signs of, of the body, right? Um, particularly amid conditions of contemporary um, environmental, political, or economic precarity. Um, and so I'll just show a couple of, of um, works. I, I think partly because in this, this you know, new direction of thought does really complicate, I think, or seek to complicate the relationship between form and material. Mm. Um, and the relationship between um, language and more uh, sort of tangible materials of making. Um, I have been doing a lot more thinking across across media, right, across modes mm. of making. Um, and so, you know, recently, let me pull up my, um, there we go. Um, so recently I've been thinking um, in, in a piece that I've been writing um that I'm working on right now. Um, I've been thinking about this painting by Peter Bruegel, um, Landscape with the Fall of Icarus, and this poem by Auden, um, Musée des Beaux-Arts, um, which is one of the poems, William, William Carlos Williams also wrote a poem on this, on this painting, but one of the poems that responds um, ekphrastically to this painting. Um, and in, 
And what interests me about this painting and Auden's poem is that in some ways, what is staged in both the poem and the painting um, is, is an attentional perceptual, an attentional perceptual and therefore ethical blind spot. Um, when we look at this painting, um, you know, we have the title of the painting announce, announcing this kind of like mythic tragedy. Um, but the painting itself is configured as landscape, right? And is and there are many other things going on. Um, when I ask my students to look at this painting, you know, they and describe what they see, you know, they often describe the sort of sense of tranquility, the horizon, the small bird, the city in the distance, the plowman looking at the plow. Um, and sometimes it actually takes people quite a long time to to spot Icarus down in the um lower sort of middle ground corner, right? Um, these these legs entering the water. Um, and Auden's poem, which I don't know if there's time, maybe I can read the poem. Um, but Auden's poem looks at the formal configuration of this painting and 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 in some ways like recomposes that um, that very blind spot or that formal configuration in language. Um, so I'll just read the poem and there's a lot to, there's a lot that has been said about this poem. There's a lot to say about this poem, so I won't go on and on about it, but, um, he writes, um, about suffering, they were never wrong. The old masters, how well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along, how when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an, an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. And so in this poem, you know, in some ways, you know, the the title, unlike the painting, does not announce the fall of Icarus. In fact, it locates us in the museum. The whole first stanza, the references are actually drawn from other Bruegel paintings, um, The Martyr of the Innocents, for example, um, that would have been nearby in the gallery. And so even the, the attentional drift of the poem itself is not fixated ekphrastically on this one painting, but is in fact taking in kind of the surroundings um, while framing this long sentence, right? Um, we open in this odd kind of um, prepositional mode. It is actually quite a difficult sentence to follow, right? By the time we get down to the bottom of the sentence with the tree, we almost need as, as listeners or readers to go back and figure out what the subject of the sentence was <laughs> after all of those how clauses, right? Um, and then Icarus is brought in as a for instance, right? As an, as an example of something else. Um, so in relationship to this poem, I've really been thinking about Claudia Rankine's Citizen, which is on microaggressions in the United States, in particular racial microaggressions um, and the ways in which, you know, the, the, ex the, the systemic power of microaggression is, is precisely the way they fall under the attentional radar um, and the way social structures, social um, interactions, conversations, um, there's this impulse to have things keep going, right? To continue on, to not stop whatever is happening to address this violence that happened in the periphery. Um, or under the kind of under the fabric of the interaction. Um, and interestingly, you know, 
ranking at, at the end of citizen ranking includes um, not words, but images. And in fact, a painting and a detail of the painting um, without further sort of explanation. And she talks about her decision to do that in an interview. Um, but the painting um, is J.M.W. Turner's slave ship, um, which is, you know, a depiction of the Zong um, massacre. But but at first glance, right, the painting is is a is a majestic seascape, like so many other Turners, right, with this wash of gold and the um, sort of storm lit sunset and you know the reds and the golds and it's sort of this the the ship is large but in some ways rendered small by the size of the sea and the sky and we don't and we may not initially notice what's taking place in the foreground and across across the waves right um which is this right um and we might notice this leg and Rankin actually puts this detail of the painting um, opposing the, main, the, the image as a whole. We notice this. Um, and if we, you know, which is of course the leg being entered, enter, the leg entering the water, the slaves being thrown overboard so that the slavers can um, hope to um, uh, capture insurance money for the loss of property. Um, but as we look, of course, you know, after seeing that that one central, the the sort of most visible leg entering the water in the in the lower corner, if we look across the waves, across the water, we see many more hands, right, and feet and chains, right, that weren't initially perhaps um, uh, sort of like um, see that didn't initially capture our attention, um, and that there are many more than we we thought. Um, so that's one in, sort of a way that I've been thinking about um, this location of attention in the body and also its limitedness, and then the medical, the meta ethical stakes of that limitedness of our attention. Um, I can say another um, artist I've been thinking about a lot with this relationship between attention poetry um, and the act of making. Um, is Cecilia Vicuña, um, who works across language and material sculpture, um, and is really interested and invested in this idea of precarity, both as environmental political um, problem or condition, but also as a site of a site of poesis and an imp an, an impetus. Um, an underlying impetus for making um, is responding to these 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 states of instability and vulnerability. Um, one of the practices that Vicuña has had for a long time um, that she started actually um, as a grad student in art in London um, is the creation of these precarios using um, using trash using using debris um, and part of the beauty of the precarios these objects. Um, is both that they're formed, but they're formed using found materials and often presented in ways that are are precisely against permanence. Right here, we see this precario is is put into wet sand, and as viewers, we know that this this particular configuration cannot last forever, except you know as a photograph. Um, there are other um, precarios that have been you know captured in put under glass in museums, um, such as the Tate. Um, but, uh, you know, but in some ways, like these objects ask us to think about um, both the tension between the, the permanent um, object, whether it's a sculpture or a poem, and impermanence, right? The impermanence of the life that made it, the impermanence of the lives that, that view it or receive it, um, and its its connection to, um, to unstable processes right as an unstable object so i feel i've talked for too long so i'll stop the show. <laughs> <laughs> well i wonder lucy can we stay with you and that problem okay. of unstable okay. form i mean in your experience of both the first project and then the second one you gave us a hint of um have you found yourself needing to switch your mode of attention to attend to different kinds of work different genres different forms if you like yeah yeah, so I mean, in the first book, um, I I looked primarily. I did. I in one of the chapters, I I looked at at painting, um, 
but almost all of the cases that I was looking at, I looked at a huge range of poems, so in different languages and across time periods, but they were all, I was looking at poems on the page. Mm -hmm. um, and in this project, um, for example, with, with Vicuña, who I'm really interested in her use of, of breath, I've had to rely a lot more on recordings of readings to look at how the how the poems live as an impermanent performance um, and how she she uses breath and particularly sort of like audible breathing um, to almost create a space around the poem and like into which mm -hmm. her words sort of you know can be uttered but she she'll often use sort of like um, not silence but like breathing almost as a as a kind of demarcation of silence or as this sort of medium of the voice um, even without words in it and that's you know that requires thinking off of the page and thinking about um, how poems and other language acts exist in time um, and also sort of create spaces of time or create objects of time um, mm. so that's one example that's great. Thank you, Lucy. Um, John, can I throw that one at you as well? Because going back to the way you narrated these pivots between what you've worked on, um, the movement from art to language poets back out to photography was super clear. And I'm just wondering if you've come across differences in thought or method that you've had to, to sort of adopt or adapt to when dealing with linguistic objects on the one hand and sculptural or three-dimensional or, or printed objects on another hand? Um, yeah, well, maybe it's worth talking about. I mean, I started off talking about the movement from um, my interest in more conceptual practices and then towards photography and towards... Um, portraiture right I mean Peter Hujo is a, a portrait artist um in some ways a kind of classical portrait artist these they're all the same format they are centered portraits you know formally they're not obviously complex works but what sits between um on the one hand my earlier interest in conceptualism and what seems like quite a kind of hard left turn towards a fairly classical mode of analog photography i mean what sits in between those two things is an experience of bodies right and it's quite a particular experience of bodies i was interested in hujar's work already but then in 2019 you know my father had a very long and painful illness um which i you know it was hospitalized for a long time i had a, I spent a lot of time with him. Um, I spent a lot of time watching a body disintegrate effectively. Mm. Uh, and then five months later, my own son was born. Mm. So I then had oh, oh, witnessed <laughs> pregnancy and birth uh, within five months of each other. And there's definitely, you know, those two extremely um, threshold <laughs> bodily experiences or where I would locate that shift in 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 my interest and in my in and in the kinds of modes of attention that I became interested in, right? Mm -hmm. um, how to articulate that? Well, it's not straightforward. <laughs> I don't think. Um, you know, on on. It, this maybe comes down to or, or opens up the space for thinking about the relation between ethics and different modes of attention because certainly when you know I was uh, watching a death happen I was trying to imagine what kind of image you could make of this that would in some way record mm. you know um, what was happening and recognize that for me, you know, if I was to try and take such an image as that, it would simply be, it would end up as a kind of image of desolation without any kind of, it, 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 it wouldn't be able to express or contain any of the kind of questions or the issues around the body or the ethical questions around medical practice and so on and so forth that I would want it to contain. And so 
in a way I moved towards Fujar's portraits because it seemed to me that they, you know, as I said before, were able to stage something that was a staging or a performance of a certain kind of ethical relation between subjects but which was also able to um, materially contain or present or, or embody at the level of its materiality and how it had been produced, um, a kind of ethics of attention and ethics of care. Mm. You know, Huja was a kind of, was a, a, a dark room, like a master of the dark room. Um, and the way in which he's able to manipulate tonalities on the material of an analog photograph in order to produce a certain narrative or to produce a certain affect um, became really important to me. And, you know, if you put two different Hujar prints side by side, you see that he's trying to do something totally different. And uh, very interestingly, a friend of his, Gary Schneider, said to me that often it's about veiling and protection. And he uses the dark room and he uses materiality to kind of unveil or protect you know he'll use spotting in order to protect something about the sitter so there's this very kind of open question around the ethics of the relation between him and the person who's sitting in front of him that became um kind of interesting to me but also whilst <clears throat> i was thinking about whilst that, that lovely reading of the Auden poem it made me think about you know the overstated often <laughs> Auden quote from the Yeats elegy, of course, that poetry makes nothing happen. Right? Mm. And if you, <clears throat> uh, whilst that poem is being read and whilst, and Lucy was showing the other uh, works and how you kind of have to, a certain mode of attention needs to be engaged in order to enter into the ethical space of that work, that the nothing that's, that it's an actual nothing that's happening rather than it makes nothing happen. Which was kind of interesting to me that it's an active there's something about that mode of attention that's active in the nothing mm. um so yeah i mean in terms of I, I, I don't know it's very difficult to talk about at the moment isn't it i guess because of what's happening <laughs> in the world <laughs> i mean i was just thinking when lucy was speaking about I, I think we've used a few times the term what's asked of us in a poem or what's asked of us in a sculpture or what's asked of us by a work of art and so on and so forth. And when Lucy was talking about all the kind of outside of the frame of the poem or outside of the frame of the work of art, I mean, again, it's something I think about with Huja often is what's outside of the frame, right? That, what's, that he manages through a kind of certain mode of attention to make manifest within this very kind of classical image the body that is within that frame, you can read off from it all the kind of forces, the social forces that are acting upon that body, the political forces, the economic forces, and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I was thinking about, well, what, what is being asked of us by an artwork and what can we, exp what can, in a sense, it's a kind of odd way of putting it, but what can the artwork expect from us when our bodies and our nervous systems <laughs> And everything else is so under pressure from everything that's happening. And so I was, you know, I wonder if that's something that we could explore further or whether Lucy had something to say about that. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Um, it's interesting there. I, so I, I, I didn't know about um, that experience that you had about of, um, ex you know, being present for slash witnessing slash being part of um, your father's illness um, and the the closeness of that um, transition to birth. Um, mm -hmm. The first chapter of the project I'm working on is actually called In Intensive Care, um, Poetic Attention and the Precarious Body. And it's called Intensive Care because the opening takes place actually in the in intensive care unit at University of Virginia Medical Hospital, um, where my mother was in a really long coma, um, two comas actually that lasted for months while I was writing my dissertation on attention. Um, and it just, I was thinking in that piece about that precise experience of sitting 
sitting with a body. Um, in that case, a body that um, is not visibly alive is being kept alive by breathing machines and by IVs and by you know life support, all the machinations of of life support. And so the beeps and the fluid bag and all you know this whole sort of like um, and that 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 act of just sort of sitting, having dropped everything and sitting with my siblings, sort of taking shifts waiting for her to wake up if she woke up and then we would see you know how much damage um to the brain had occurred during the long comas um that there i found that there there wasn't language for that you know there there wasn't language for the kind of combination of grief and vigilance and also just the the muck of daily experience all the the muchness of sweat and like not being able to take a shower for too long you know and like you know the kind of like gross hospital coffee in your mouth and like you know just um you know and then and she did eventually wake up from that um with a with a lot of brain damage um that then became a different kind of long process of of um being with over the years um and she she passed away actually this past January. Um, but so that experience of, of the, the prolonged being with a body as it changes uh, with a mind as it changes. And then also just the fact of grief, you know, just the inevitability and the ways in which all of the language surrounding grief are, are insufficient, um, for that experience. Um, that I th I think that that rubs that sort of brushes against what you were talking about there being a kind of active nothing, um, a doing of nothing. That in some ways, like you know, at the heart of all, so much like of poetic language and other kinds of making really have to do to with giving shape to, immortalizing in some way, giving expression or externalization to life. Right there, there's these works, whether they're visual or linguistic, are signs of life. Um, and, and I think there, that's part of why there is this sense of like, we're in, in relation to almost a living thing when we are in relation to an artwork, but also as signs of life, they're also signs of death, right. Or signs of whatever is life's opposite, which is, I don't think is death actually, but, um, is whatever is whatever active, nothing is not, is not life. Right. Um, and they and it seems to me that in that impulse of of making objects complex enough to somehow be signs of life in an active sense there's also this like other presence underneath that um that act of making you know the knowledge of impermanence or um the knowledge of of limitation or or just like all the kinds and scales of grief that we're that we're constantly enmeshed in. I mean, I think about um, what's taking place in the world right now and the way that we still um, have to, you know, make a lunch or pick up our kids or go to the um, doctor or whatever it is, you know, go teach class or grade the papers or, you know, and, and meanwhile, <laughs> um, you know, we have sort of catastrophic uh, tragedy unfolding on so many fronts, right, at, at once. Um, and I think about um, Ilya Kaminsky's poem mm. in his volume, Death Republic, Death Republic where um, flanking that sort of like play in a volume, it's almost like a, a staged theater play the the shape that that volume takes but flanking the the play that unfolds in the volume of these two poems both of which really look at this right um one of them um looks at uh at an event of of police brutality that then gets sort of goes viral on people's phone right we watch we watch others watch, we watch our phones, we watch others watch their phones, right, as this event gets circulated. And and meanwhile, you know, the body of a boy lies on the pavement, right? Um, and, um, you know, or meanwhile, 
there's a non-doing that is all of that looking, all of that watching, all of that virility of vi viral nature of of watching others watch. Um, and, you know, he, he talks about like, mean, meanwhile, you know, we still have to go to the dentist. We have to um, pick our kids up. We have to, you know, we have to make a summer salad. Um, and he has a moment um, that's, where this notion of forgive me or forgive us is placed in parentheses, where on the one hand, there's a kind of like imperative or urgency to continuing to live, continuing to find beauty in a summer salad or find beauty in how bright is the sky, how bright, you know, um, while also holding the kind of guilt or burden of responsibility for those those joys or for finding beauty in the world as it um, as it falls apart. Yeah, and I, I mean I, earlier, Lucy, you, you you know you phrased it as a the meta ethical status of our limited attention, and 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 that being the converse way of thinking about. It. I wonder if if we could take from that thought outwards. I mean, this is kind of both a ridiculous question to even ask, but I think it's one that all three of us have chosen to sort of stay with in that given all the horrors and complexities of the world, we're still talking about sort of aesthetic acts. So we're talking about aesthetic objects and there are loads of more useful things we could do with our time. So, so I'm wondering in the spirit of that meta-ethical, uh, uh, yeah, status of limited attention, what is it that's particular and still interesting about paying attention to constructed aesthetic gestures, be they representations or presentations or wherever else, like what, and, and I'm, I guess I'm saying that's a ridiculous question because it's so big and I'm not necessarily looking for grand answers and certainly not universal theories, but I guess why keep coming back? You know, why keep turning back to poetry or the picture or the object and, and whatnot? John, I, I wonder if you, maybe we could pick up with that because I know you have strong feelings about what that almost classical looking staging of Huijia's photos is very intentionally mm. doing as something almost operatic. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, <clears throat> I'll take it from the perspective of why, you know, as you say, when there are so many other things we could be attending to in different kind of ways, why still attend to an aesthetic object or manifestation? I mean, it's a, it might sound slightly naive, but the way I'd want to look at it would be to say that in a sense, it seems to me that an aesthetic object contains, it's like a cynic doke for, you know, Hannah Arendt's idea of natality or something like that, you know, that it contains the act of making and its material residue contains something like the possibility of newness, right? The possibility of the absolutely new, that there's always the possibility of the absolutely new in, in, in and, even if the artwork itself doesn't um, or can never really, I suppose, live up to that absolutely newness. It's the promise that there is that possibility. Um, and I don't know, as I say, it's, it sounds incredibly naive when it comes out of my mouth, but I suppose in the current situation, it feels like you've got to hold on to something. <laughs> and maybe, and maybe the val that uh, maybe the value then of the aesthetic object is is that it contains that promise of the absolutely new that there can be something original in a sense, mm. not originary, but mm. in a limited sense of original. Mm. Um, there's the promise of of other possibilities um, in the aesthetic object, but also that at the same time it, it can be both the promise uh, this comes back i suppose to the conversation around grief um and life or grief and desire and it's certainly true of hujar's images because they're so saturated with the histories um that actually came after them i mean peter hujar never after his aids diagnosis he never took any more photographs the last year of his life he refused to make work and there's something interesting in that um but of course they are now retrospectively have become kind of memento mori objects in some way for for the aids crisis but at the same time they it's limiting to to for them only to become memorial 
I mean, what's so interesting, I suppose, is that they, what I'm trying to say is that the art object can contain both possibility of the absolutely new or the, or newness itself and the memorial at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's something inherently valuable about being able to keep those two things open. Mm. Does that ring for you, Lucy? Yeah, it does. Um, I don't, I mean, I was thinking about, um, you know, Christina Sharp in her newest book, Ordinary Notes, um, one of the notes is about um, her mother's practice of, of stitching, right? Um, and of putting pins uh, away in the pin cushion in this very sort of like lovely orderly way. Um, and it's about a, a lot of other things too, but in that note, out of thinking about this very sort of like mundane practice of, of beauty, she, um, she puts forward this idea of beauty as method. Um, and, and I find that idea so um, compelling, this idea of beauty, not as object or as um, sort of product or a certain quality for the beholder, but as practice, right, as method um, of being in the world. And in some ways, like as, as, as a kind of um, survival method, you know, a way of, um, of actually producing something that, that might um, help one's, uh, help like one's world or, or that might extend toward another. I think about, um, Pao Tselan in the Meridian speech talking about um, the poem as as underway, you know, and and as on on the way, and as and as importantly as as always reaching toward um, another, right? Um, and that idea of 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 reaching, um, I think, resonates in some ways with what John was saying about neutrality or about this idea of po potential, right? This unguaranteed. Um, space of potential right this reach that a, a point of connection or or point of relation might be possible and if not guaranteed you know not never guaranteed but the that relation even through this this object relation to another life or the creation of something new or the kind of like i mean it, that it seems like in that idea of the creation of the of the absolutely new is like almost like what is the what is the spark of life what is it that we love um about living things or about life or about the interconnection of lives you know like what is it that we um love in the world right and thinking of that spark of like both um both dependency and also like whatever like this is something a, a spark of something new right um like this, both newness and continuation um, seems like it, at play in that idea of, of, you know, not, of not so much the, the work of art um, itself as the like, sort of the object capital O of our rapt attention and of our aesthetic contemplation. Although I love that too. <laughs> um, but uh but as but as process right and as as a method of 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 being in the world that where where even small acts or small mundane practices mm -hmm. um can have this sort of like can can be a place of joy or can be a place of life or of newness or of creation right mm -hmm. something other than um like oppression going along with the system you know like there's like this moment right of of some the possibility of something else um i don't know it's a um rather than rehearse any scripted ideas here i mean is there anything either of you would like to bring into the conversation because i realize my my steers might point in certain directions but i know you've both got loads to say on these topics and related things so just want to say i mean i i looking at um you know huja is totally new to me and looking at the photos that john shared 
you know, I, I think it's, I, you know, even like in just now when I was saying like the the object, the the aesthetic, the act of aesthetic absorption, there actually is something just kind of magical, I think, about even over Zoom, over a webinar screen share of seeing works that I haven't seen before, mm -hmm. um, that that feeling of something happening, right, in in looking at 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 works that, you know, operate in their own particular way or that um it's like that that sense of like that a uh, something happening like just in in looking even over the the least ideal uh you know in the least ideal sort of conditions for contemplation you know over over zoom and and with all the technological interference so i just wanted to thank you for that honestly um I, I, something i was thinking about just now was where the status of consolation <laughs> um, sits within any of this. I mean, certainly when I was younger, I, I was very much of the kind of holding with the avant-garde opinion that consolation was inherently terrible, <laughs> that there should be no <laughs> consolation, you know, that that it's political, politically reactionary to... Um, find consolation in beauty because you know there is a terrible world and one mustn't be consoled one must act and so on and so forth um and i think i suppose that's one thing that has fallen away or at least come into question for me <laughs> it seems to me that you know as lucy was saying to, to be able to attend you know, in, in, or even to say that in some ways certain types of aesthetic object, and, and I'm aware as I'm saying this that even the way I'm saying it is loaded in some way, but give us license <laughs> to attend to the everydayness of what we need to do um, by rendering it um, beautiful or rendering it in some way um, making it open to a mode of attention that it otherwise wouldn't necessarily be open to. So I suppose I'm, uh, in a not particularly clear way, I'm, I'm wanting to make a case for consolation, <laughs> um, uh, which is a sign that I'm getting old, I think, but nonetheless. Um, and uh, I wanna yeah, make a case that there, there is a space, but again, it's that holding open, I, I think, to come back, you know, I'm harping on with Huja, but you know, that's what I'm working on all the time at the moment. <laughs> that it opens a space for um, holding certain things in suspension. It seems to me, in in a, in a Huja portrait, all kinds of categories it seems are sort of held in suspension for the time that you're looking at it, and there's a real value to that. And I think that's also true. You know, Lucy mentioned Salan. I think Salan poems do that too. They hold categories. They hold categories in suspension, a kind of crystalline suspension. Um, and I think there's a real value to that in 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 a in a mediatical space in which you know we're constantly being asked not to hold anything in suspension. Mm. Um, just put your attention here now you must do this, you must act in this way, something must happen, or you must just look at this, on this and this and this. The things to be held in suspension. Um, you know, a Salan, in the Salan's corona, there's that great moment where it kind of hinges on the line, it is time. And how that works within the poem of, of both being the hinge within the poem, but also about the temporality of the poetic space that it opens up and the erotic space that that poem opens up and all kinds of other spaces that that poem, I mean, it's an extremely rich and interesting poem. So, yeah, I don't know, I'm arguing, I suppose, just for consolation space. I don't know, I guess that's just of the moment, as well as, of course, being able to act within that necessarily. I guess all forms of attention are always of their moment, aren't they? Mm -hmm. encountered and, and nested as well right within everything else that's going on in life i don't know lucy is there anything else you'd like to bring up 
while we're around these topics or the exhibition or anything else? Well, I guess I was just thinking about um, what John was saying about consolation um, in relationship to to Hannah Arendt's work on, you know, thoughts on the importance of forgetting. Mm -hmm. The words never forget have been on my mind a lot in the last two weeks. Um, and, you know, I've been thinking about the ways in which, of course, you know, on the one hand, um, there's an importance and an, an imperative and a responsibility to remember, right? This is the work of history. This is the work of memorialization. This is the work of um, doing wake work to invoke sharp again. Um, but then there are ways in which, you know, um, the act of remembering can become weaponized, right? Um, and, um, and trying to figure that out, you know, trying to, trying to balance, um, between the, the, the need to remember and the, the times when, you know, like something else is called for it is sort of, is, is an impossible space. Right. And I think like, I think about what you were saying, John, about the ways in which certain poems, Ceylon's poems certainly, um, hold, hold a space open, um, without, closing it down into uh, um, a particular statement, right? There, that, that in some ways her, his poems cannot be stated. <laughs> hmm. um, they're not statements, you know, they're, they're doing something else, right? They're holding a space open. And, and I, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't have anything, um, you know, to say or to state about that only, only that those things have been on my mind you know this challenge of of like how to, how to balance also so many griefs at one time right of of multiple griefs multiple rememberings and multiple um harms right multiple calls calls for action and and then also the the need to to kind of like hold back and and hold open um to allow for that complexity and all those complexities to coexist. It's, it's, it's really an impossible space. I mean, I think this is why like we keep turning to complex works because they, um, they offer that complexity and dimensionality and a, and a certain refusal of, of easy statement, right. Or of, of easy um, ideological position, certainly. Yeah. I think I'm about to do the most reductive thing I could do in answer to <laughs> your celebration of complexity. I'm going to say we've got to end. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I want to thank you both. That was a, an amazing conversation. And so both for the personal insights and for the tracks of discussion afterwards. Um, it's been a huge pleasure. I'm sorry that this is the last talk in the series, but I, I hope there'll be more in other forms. Um, so thanks, everyone, for joining and watching. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you all at events in the future. Thank you. Thank you.